guys, welcome back to Magic TV. My name's Craig. It is nine o'clock and it's time for a talk magic. And here right now on this channel, I have an absolute legend of the magic community that's that's been interviewed. Somebody I've been a big fan of for years, gold star member of the, the magic circle, had one of the most successful careers in magic. Uh, the man behind the the, uh, the Sooty Show, as well as being an incredibly successful performer, illusionist. He's currently going on tour on him uh, with him uh, with a, a big touring show. Then he's got Panto. With I mean, there's so much going on. It makes me tired just thinking about it. I don't <laughs> use the word legend lightly. He really is the one and only Richard Cadell. <laughs> How are you, Richard? Are you okay? Oh, um, well, I, I'm fat. Yeah, I'm great. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Craig, for that ridiculous introduction it's i don't think of myself as, no bless you for saying that what a kind thing I'm, i don't know what to, I, I, how can i answer that it's very kind of you i've just i've been very lucky i've been able to sort of coast through life doing what i love so and it's always a magic's been there from from when i was a little tiny kid so I've, I've just been able to carve a living doing my childhood passion really i mean that, that's it you know you know there's a lot of magicians worldwide that are successful and they have a successful career but there's very few magicians that make the impact that that have the impact on not just the community, but like literally everybody that you've had. Like I know from speaking to people, there are so many magicians that are magicians now, professional magicians, because of because of watching you over the over over the uh, you know over the years. Like seriously, you you have created an entire generation of magicians with some of the output that you've you've you know put out over the years i mean seriously i Hang genuinely <laughs> i'm so excited know? the camera's dropping like that's how excited i am about this pop, it pops out yeah it was <laughs> with emotion um there we are with that. <laughs> I could have timed that better um that I, I don't know what to say to that i, I mean i mean I, I i've no one's ever said that to me i mean i suppose i've I mean, oh, I'm 54 now. I remember that was with, we were just talking, I was with Russ Steen yesterday and we were talking about the Blackpool Magic Convention and, and, and how important kids are within that. And, and I said, well, I was 12, I think, when I came to my first Blackpool Magic Convention. And, um, and I watched all those, all those people, I suppose, that influenced me, that made me want to, to do it, you know? And so I never considered anyone would be watching me and well listen I hope it's wonderful to think that somebody somewhere has, has, has got the bug through some of the nonsense I've I've done and and, and thank you for saying that and well, I'm, I'm very humbled I'm very humbled it's true but as well as being a magician and a performer you've also definitely can be classed as an entrepreneur I mean you've built a massive brand I mean there was already a brand there but you can't argue that you've taken Sooty to an entirely new level um which is which is great and i really want to kind of dissect some of the things that you've done and 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 some of the decisions you've made and i obviously want to talk about the tour because that's a total departure for you with what's coming up soon i want to i want to talk about that there's lots to talk about basically go for it ask, well, ask me anything ask me anything start, right let's start at the very beginning uh just for anybody who's been living under a rock and they're watching this and they go who's this richard cuddle guy Let's start at the very beginning and let's just very quickly touch on the origin story. You mentioned there that you were 12 year, years old when you got into magic. How I was, did, I, I was no? younger. I was younger. How did, it, how did you get into magic? Where did it all come from? Um, I had a, well, it sort of happened, a few things sort of all, the stars kind of aligned. I had a magician to my party when I was five or he probably younger, a guy called Brian Lee. Um, who became a lifelong friend, and and he was the, a magician, Lester, and and I just knew I kind of wanted to, to to know more about it. He gave me a balloon to put under the pillow and all the jokes and stuff, but I was just a, a, you know mad about it. And then I started getting magic sets, the usual thing. But the big turning point for me um, was I was doing child acting, um, and my mother was a professional actress, so she was, I loved it, and she was able to get me into auditions and things, and I was doing some child, child acting, and there was a guy in the same play with me who was learning his next role after he finished the play I was in, was to play the part of a magician, and he was telling me um, that he was having lessons in magic from someone in the magic circle. And I was only a kid and my parents were at that time forcing me to have piano lessons. And I hated it, I dreaded it, I hated it. So I went back to my mum and I went, 
that guy Herbert, he's having magic lessons. I, I just the idea of having magic lessons was incredible. I said, can I please swap these horrible piano lessons for the magic lessons? And they agreed. And a member of the Leicester Magic Circle called Brian Glover came to my house and started teaching me magic. And every Friday he would come and uh, he became again a lifelong friend and a mentor and, and was with me all the way through, you know, right even now, you know, he's still my, my, my friend, he's in his eighties, but when I was doing my illusions professionally, when I was you know, doing all that stuff, he was there in the audience watching. I mean, he was on that journey all the way through, you know, took me to the Reading Junior Day, which at the time was the only thing for young magicians. And that was a, an incredible experience. Then I entered the competition and then I went into the Young Magician of the Year competition. I was 15 um, when I went into that and uh, lucky enough to, to have won it, which was again, incredible. And, and, and so, yeah, I think it was that, that combination, that luck of being in that play and having magic lessons by a magician that was a, was a really good teacher and taught me the rudiments. So I kind of had a bit of a head start. Yeah, I was lucky, but I soaked it up and I loved it. You know, I just loved every second of it. And when, when you were learning magic, was there a, was there an end goal? Because you're, you're a child actor, you're taking magic lessons. Were you thinking, you know what, I think I could make a profession out of doing this? Or was it just a fun thing that you were, you were, you were learning to, you know, just... No, there was never any doubt that I'd, I'd do it as a living or do performing. My mother was an actress. Um, she'd done it professionally. So my dad was a doctor and wanted me to sort of go to college and university. My mum said, he, he's never going to do that, Ron, you know, you forget, forget that. So when I was, I left school I, and, and I was a holiday camp entertainer within a few weeks, literally, of leaving school. I was barely 16 and I was a green coat down at Hailing Island doing my little magic shows, my children's shows, Punch and Judy, um, DJing, Keep Fit. I mean, I did everything in the holiday camp. I loved every second of it. So, no, there was never any doubt that I'd, I do that because I just couldn't imagine myself doing anything else, you know. Um, so yeah, I was straight into it. Best experience I ever had in the holiday camp it was incredible. Mm. Well, I want to talk about that, but before we do, your magic lessons. You, we don't think of you as a close-up magician. We think of you as a stage performer and illusionist, and so on and so forth. Where did you start learning stage magic? Was it right at the very beginning when you had magic lessons? Or did you start learning little closer bits and pieces? And what made you gravitate towards stage? Right. Well, there was a stage. I mean, back in that era, I'm going back into the early 80s when you went in competition, there was more, there were more stage acts. You know, it's not so much now, it's more close-up. But my magic teacher, Brian Glover, was very he taught me the rudiments so I could do close-up I could do coin manipulation I could do some very basic card manipulation he said you need to learn you need you need you need this and then we did so I could do a bit of close-up and then I'd concentrate on stage magic but it wasn't it wasn't illusions if anything he kind of dis I wanted to do the illusions I remember seeing a Siegfried and Roy special that had found its way onto ITV and going <gasps> and my magic Brian saying look that the trouble with illusions, and he was absolutely right. I mean, I remember him saying, he said, the props, unless you've got a huge personality like Siegfried and Roy, the props are bigger than you are. And, and you, you've got to be bigger than the props. Whereas if you've got something small, it can be, and the magic is all about you and it's not about the props. And, and he was right. Um, but I knew when I saw the illusions, there was something in me that just, I loved that spectacular nonsense of it all. But I think looking back, and this is, I can often tell when I look at illusion acts, um, the better ones, when they've had a grounding in those rudiment, you know, the rudiments of magic and, uh, and stuff, it, it, it does translate into the, into the boxes, even though a lot of magicians are quick to dismiss boxes and big props as self-working. But actually, you know, having that foundation is very important, having an understanding of, of, of all of it, you know. Uh, and I was lucky that Brian made sure that I did it was part of the thing I remember doing coins across and actually it was quite difficult for me at the time and he made me do it and he made me go to school and try and palm a two pence piece which was quite you know obviously the change was bigger he said you've got to get through the whole of the day without without dropping that you've got to write you've got to do everything and see if you can get and I tried it but you know I didn't always succeed but I tried to get through the day without <laughs> anyone saying what's that in your hand it was great fun you know so that's yeah. great anyway. that's fantastic and then obviously you, you move on to the holiday parks. So you weren't like doing the holiday park circuit as a visiting cabaret act. You were stationed in one holiday park as like a coat entertainer, but you were getting a chance to do your show, which I imagine would yeah. give you lots of experience and lots of flight time, which is kind of what you need, right? 
Well, it did. And I, I, I tell you what happened, actually. Um, I, I learned a hard lesson then, which I learned when I got into the holiday camp, because I, I suddenly, suddenly I was DJing and I was doing all sorts of things because they make you do everything. And that's great. And I learned that the magic that I'd learned for the Young Magician of the Year act and stuff like that didn't go very well in front of the, the holiday camp audience. And we had a visiting act that used to come in every week, which I think was an act called Richard and Lara Charmaine, if I remember correctly, who used to storm the place with a sub trunk and a zigzag and, and some, some stuff uh, and an invisible deck and stuff like that. And that's when I realized there was, you know, I really, the penny really dropped, hang on a minute. If I'm gonna work commercially, I need to, I need to tweak what I'm doing. Um, and I, like my ho first holiday season, I hope this isn't boring, by the way, but no, I, it's lovely to reminisce. I don't, I don't get the chance to reminisce, but this is all <laughs> bloody fact. My, my holiday camp's gone, long, long gone. It was on Hailing Island, which is down near Portsmouth. And there was an illusion builder on the Isle of Wight called the Magic Box, a guy called Sid Edwards. And that was only a, you know, a ferry ride away. And he built me a substitution trunk because I'd seen Richard and Lara do this thing. And I thought, oh, I'd like that. I'd love one of those boxes. And it was £300, a great sub trunk. I've still got it. But I was on, I think, at the time, something like 80 quid a week as a holiday camp entertainer. And you had to buy your own food. So the lady in the gift shop felt sorry for me. And she used to give me all the popcorn at the end of the day they hadn't sold. So I sort of lived on popcorn and I saved the money to be able to buy this sub trunk. And I remember going over there and Sid Edwards picking me up from the ferry and me having this big prop and just setting it up in my tiny chalet. And I hadn't got anyone to perform it with, but I just remember looking at it like it was the crown jewels, like, like you know, this was the best thing I'd ever bought. And the first time I did it, I mean, I think the switch probably took forever. It's probably half an hour while I was shaking the cloth with some other green coat I'd managed to talk into doing it. But I kind of knew then, I thought this is, you know, the audience loved that. And I thought, hang on a minute, you know, this is, I, I'd love to do more of this. And then there was another a moment as well, a big moment in the holiday camp. A friend of mine that I'd known as a young magician um, when we were kicking around Reading Junior Day, he visited the holiday camp as a visiting act. I was just a green coat. And he said, um, he said, oh, he, said, he was doing illusions. And he said, oh, I've, I've bought this illusion of Derek Lever. He said, I bought this illusion. He said, it doesn't work. I can't make it work. It's an impaled illusion. He said, um, it, it, it's all, and I've got a bit of a mechanical sort of brain. I love mechanics and all that stuff. So I said, well, I'll fix it. He said, oh, don't, no, he said, I, he said, I'm sick of it. He said, I just want to sell it. And I hadn't got any money at the time. Anyway, he said, well, if you want to buy it, you can owe me the money. So he left me with this impaled illusion. I thought, well, I've got the sub trunk. I've got this impaled. I'm going to make it work. Now, now I had an act. Mm. Now I had an act. So that's where it said, OK, here we go. And, and, I, and, and, and I, you know, I went on the impaler and, and uh, I got it to work. And, um, and that, I think that was the turning point. Where I thought, OK, I've got two big props now. Now I need a girl assistant and now I'm going to get anyway and and so it went and that's my that's when the path turned towards the the bigger props yeah and so how long was it before you left the holiday park because i imagine as you put that act together you kind of got to the point where you're like okay i'm kind of being restricted here i'm i've got a show that's good enough to to tour different holiday parks or do something else what was your next step after putting the act together um well i only did a year at the holiday park because the guy one of the ents team it was really good, said to me, don't only do a year because there's some of those green coats have been there for, for years and years and years and they just got trapped in a bubble. And he said, you've got to get out of this otherwise, because I wanted to go back because you become a little star. By the end of the week, when you do your act, those those holiday makers, they love you and know you because you're Richard, the guy that's done the crazy golf and helped the kids. And mm. so they, they go crazy for you. But in the real world, it was, it was very different because they don't know who you are. So this, this, the advice was to get out there and, and, um, and, and I found it quite hard. And I'll be honest with you, I died on my ass a lot. I got paid off when I went to, I went to Hastings and did a job on the pier with the magic. I got paid off to me. I was so bad. Yeah. I mean, with the, I, honestly, with, for the real people, just because I was, I don't know, I was a bit cheesy. It, something just didn't work. It was for a young DJ type club crowd. And I was so off the mark. They just said, oh, don't worry about going on again and go, <laughs> go, go home. So, but you have to do that. You know, you mm -hmm. have to die on your ass. Um, to, to, you have to know what that feels like to, to, to then dissect it, you know, to know what it feels like when you, to know when you get it right, you know, so. 
So yes, yeah, so it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't easy to start with. And it's true what you say, you know, that I, I toured the holiday parks for years and I was a red coat at Butlins. And in order to make it work on the holiday park circuits, you have to develop a certain style that doesn't necessarily translate to a corporate audience or, you know, something else. You try it. I remember the first time I tried to go from holiday parks and I got a gig as a corporate and I just, same thing, I just died on my ass. I tried to do my holiday park act and it just didn't work at all. So I can... Yeah absolutely completely relate to that um yeah yeah, yeah so yeah it was a long uh, interesting path the slow part i think the yeah i mean i could go on forever but go and ask me another question i'll, 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 get, I'll get boring and I'm well, I'm, I'm, no i'm finding this whole thing fascinating so you you've left uh you, you you did a year as a green coat you've left you're now trying to make it as an illusionist i suppose several questions what was the next kind of big thing Do and you know also, what? oh no go, go for it. no i'll tell you because there's a bit of a, a sad story to it, really. Uh, I don't share this with many people, but it's long enough ago. But um, I said to, you know, like I said, when I left the holiday camp, I got these two props and, and, and I died. I'm, I'm, you know, I was working commercially and I was awful. I wasn't going well. Um, and uh, I, I fell out of love with, with, not with magic, but with, with my ability, I lost a lot of confidence. I thought, well, this is, you know, Young Magician of the Year and Mag Magicians is great, but but I, I, I don't know how I'm going to do that. I keep, you know, I'm not doing a good job here. I'm not being successful. And this is, you know, I was very disillusioned. I've also got another passion and another lo a love of mine is, is amusements and fairground equipment. And, and, and I operated in the amusement business as a parallel for a long time. So I actually went from the, after I left the holiday camp, I went to a little village in Breen, and um, I spent my days running a ghost train and, uh, and in the evening I'd go and DJ and I didn't do any magic for two or three years really because I, I just kind of fell out of love with it. Um, I didn't know how it was going to work. And then I thought, you know what I'll do? I'll DJ one night, I'll do the Impaler mm. and I'll dress up as Freddy Krueger and I'll do it as a bit of a horror thing for Halloween. And I did, I dressed up as Freddy Krueger and, and I did the Impaler and it stormed. It went really well, and that's when I thought, okay, I'm back now. This is, I'm, I'm okay now. And, and and because I was working with the fun fair and, and and earning a little bit of money, um, I was able to then invest in some some bigger props and get a proper act together. Mm -hmm. And I think the real turning point was I got an agent who said, look, if you're going to do something, you know, if you're really going to crack the summer seasons and get out of the holiday centres and into the theatres, you need a big, big trick. Um, and I think he flippantly says, why don't you vanish a car or something? And, and I said, well, there's a vanishing motorcycle trick people do. You know, that's it's kind of, you know, been, been around a while. He went, well, that sounds sensational. So I thought, OK, I'll, I'll get the vanishing, the dizzy limit vanishing motorcycle. And I was living in a caravan at the time. I hadn't got a penny. I hadn't got anything. Literally living in a caravan. Yeah, with no heating. And also, honestly, <laughs> but I wanted this bloody dizzy limit trick. And I phoned Dave Shaw of quality props bless him and 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 he thought i was mad but agreed to build it and he gave me credit on it and i got these bikes and and i bought a winch and, and and i got it together and i got a summer season on the back of it at the playhouse theater and western supermare and this i had begged and borrowed every penny to get this thing together gone without you know food you know it was ridiculous and i remember getting it onto the stage getting a summer season uh, for 200 quid a week, this job was, and I had to pay two girls out of that and a guy as well. So I was, it was ridiculous. There was no money in it because I was, they were taking a chance on me. You know, my agent said, look, he's going to do this thing with a bike. No one had seen it. They didn't know what it was. And I remember rigging it and watching it vanish for the first time. And I cried. I was in the, I just, you know, the, we had the bike in the air and it all fell apart and the thing disappeared. And I cried, I cried, I sobbed. And I thought, oh my God, this we're onto something. And and I did it. And the next summer, the, the agents came to see it. And then I went, that was it then. I, I was on the summer, the theatre summer season circuit. That illusion was that that tram that was a game changer because suddenly it was, I mean, just to have a bike hanging in the air was 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 dramatic enough, but that's what they all wanted. And I did some great summer seasons when they existed, Torquay, Paynton, Weymouth, Blackpool you know, Scarborough, you know, all of those big theatres packed out, you know, with the bike trick. So that, that was the turning point, was that, that one illusion. Yeah. 
I suppose the, the lesson here is sometimes you need to take a step back to take a step forward. Like if you hadn't have moved away from magic for a while, do you think you would have achieved the same level of success if you carried on with the same mindset? Or did you think you need do you think you needed to take that step back in order to kind of find yourself again? Yeah, I, I, I think so. I think so. I, I, yeah, I've, I've always been. Yeah, I've, I've always been quite cri not critical of myself, but I've been, I suppose, realistic. Um, I know when I'm not good at something, and I just knew I could crack it um, somehow. So I held on to that little dream and that belief, and um, yeah, and we, we and I was really lucky. I aligned myself to a, 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 to two people, a, a, an assistant and her husband at the time, who were so loyal and dedicated. And uh, there's it, and, I, and we created some with no money. We created some really good stuff. I watched last night a thing on YouTube, and if any of you viewers want to Google it, Google Richard Cadell Illusion, and Magic Week put this up a few years ago. It's me on in 2000, 23 years ago, on the show called The Big Stage, doing an illusion where it's a clear substitution trunk where the girl disappears and she appears in a tank of water. Right? Wow. Uh, yeah, it's worth watching, only because this tank of water illusion, I, I built this glass tank and we, we just, I'd spent all the money on it and I was going to do it. I was going to produce the girl like a fire cage works. Now, if any of your viewers don't know what a fire cage is, it, it, I'm sure I'm giving too much away to say that it, you think you're looking at the back of the cage, you're not. All right. So I was going to do something where the girl was hidden at the back of the tank, but you thought you were looking to through to the cloth or whatever at the back, but, but you were, weren't. Well, when we tried to work, because it worked with a fire cage brilliantly, but when we tried it with the water in it, it, it didn't work at all. The, the, the water changed the perspective, it changed the colour, nothing would move because the water, but, and it was just a complete disaster. And I remember this, the, the, this girl, this wonderful assistant, Christine, insisting that she would make it work. And we were up all night. We had a summer season booked. I promised them this tank thing and we were literally going to go the next day. And we were up all night. And she said to me, she went, hang on a minute. She went, I think if I do this, I could, I could get here. And, and I went, what? She went, no, look, if I do this and do this and, and I hang on here, I could hang on. And anyway, um, and that illusion was, was, was born purely out of that girl's um, dedication to putting herself through anything to make it work. And when I look back, every time I watch that video, I thought if she hadn't have had the pure commitment and, and the pain to put herself through that we'd have never created what i think even now i actually thought when i watched it last night i must rebuild that i must do it again it's too good <laughs> just to to leave and anyway sorry i'm 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 no, you're really not this is amazing this is one of my favorite interviews well, i'm loving this well i'll tell you another thing as well you that this is a good one all right and this is more recent it just shows you should always I love listening to people. I listen to any advice that anyone's got any advice. I listen to everything because there's always within that. There's always something, you know, there's always something. And I had a lad work on the illusion show. And he's a lad that I have a fun fair business as well. And he works on the fun fair. And I needed, he's only, he was only about 18, 19 at the time. And, and I needed someone to push and pull a prop. And I'd been doing this one illusion. I'm doing it in extreme magic, but I've been doing it a good few years. And I kind of, had it built to it, it was my idea, and I knew everything about it, and blah, 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 blah. And he was, he's just a kid pushing a prop. And he just said to me, Cash, said, why do you do the switch thing there? Why don't you just do it then, instead of all of that? And I went, what? He went, well, just do it then. Why do you do all that bit? Why you just don't do it? I went, hang on a minute. I went, oh my God, you've completely revolutionized this whole thing. And he did. He he had he cut 30, 40 seconds of ambiguity out of it and he made it 20 million times more deceptive just because he'd come from it totally outside of it. And then so you should always and, and whenever I do that, I think if it wasn't for Mike, you know, little Mike. I you know, every time I do that little move, I think, well, you know, fair shout. Anyway, sorry. Now I am. <laughs> now I am becoming boring. But I just. Yeah. So I've, I've, I've basically nicked everyone's advice along the way. Taken best way life. to be best way to be so yeah. you're you're flying high you're doing summer seasons you're traveling the uk you're doing big illusions you're making bikes disappear at some point we're going to have a little yellow bear involved in this story yeah. does that come now or was there something that um, happened before that 
I'll tell you what happened. Um, and again, it's, 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 it's tinged with a bit of sadness. Um, I dreamed always of doing the best summer season in the country, which was the Blackpool Grand Theatre. That was the best summer season. It had all the, the dancers, variety acts and everything. And it was when summer seasons were coming to an end, when all those Torquays and Scarboroughs had disappeared. Only Blackpool was remaining with those big variety shows. And I was lucky enough to do that show with all my illusions. The bike trip closed the show because the, the producer said it's just, you know, it's the strongest thing in the show. And I said, I said to the stars, don't you mind that it's closing? Said, no, no, don't you know, it's great. It was the finale of the whole thing. Me riding down the audience was fantastic. Um, and I, I did that season and they announced at the end of that season that that was the end of the summer seasons at the Grand. And my agent at the time said, well, there's no theatres left now, kid. So you, you probably, you know, you might have to do the holiday centres again. I said, well, how am I going to do my bike and my water tank? And I can't do that on one night. I can't do that. He said, well, you're going to have to not do that. And, and I felt like that I'd reached the end. And I'd had an agreement with my brother, who's my business partner and best friend. And we were running the fun fair together. And I used to let him run the fun fair while I went off and did these summer seasons. And he said to me, look, Richard, he said, you've done it. You're not it's time now you you've you're actually you've had your fun you're not become the next Paul Daniels or the next big one that you dreamt you would be it's time now you came back and you put your you know that we grafted and we do this business that you promised you'd work with me because you're always running off doing these things you've had your chance if you can't better now if there's no point going back doing the holiday sense you're doing that 20 years ago so he was right so I saw I said to my brother I said well if if if, if I'm coming back I feel like a failure. So I want to come back and feel like I've done something good. So I'm going to buy a big ride. I said, I want a roller coaster. I said, I've got to come back feeling like I've achieved something otherwise. So we bought this old scrappy roller coaster from Sweden and we had to buy it really quickly. And the reason why we got it cheap, we had to go to Sweden in the freezing cold winter and take it down quick before they closed this amusement park. So um, I sold my illusions. I sold them off um, uh, and I sold various props to all sorts of people. Danny Hunt bought the vanishing motorcycle off me, which was the hardest thing to sell because I had so much history to it. And I went and to Sweden and we built this roller coaster and we, and we were pulling this roller coaster down in the, virtually in the snow. And I, so that was the end of my illusion career. I was still going to be Love Magic, but I knew I wasn't going to perform again. Uh, big stuff in that way. And my agent phoned me up, a guy called Stanley Dallas, and he went, you're sitting down. He said, um, Matthew Corbett's retiring and they want someone to replace him and you're in the frame. Now I had never really done kid stuff, but Stanley was an agent that got a lot of inroads with Granada TV. And they'd said to him, do you know anyone that can replace Matthew Corbett? He went, oh, I've got just the guy. <laughs> and, and it was like, what? I said, really? I said, but I'd done the city show as a kid, as a guest. So I said, but that, that's the gig, that gig never comes up. That's Matthew Corbett. How, it, it, surely it's, it's just not a gig that is ever a come up. I said, well, you're in the frame. Um, and I went and I just at that moment and my brother said, if you think for one moment you're going to get out of pulling this roller coaster down and loading it into the lorry and build, so don't think you're running off to do this, you, you know. So he made me do my, you know, my pound of flesh with that bloody roller coaster. But I remember getting that news in Sweden and I went to the audition and I made sure. I mean, here's I'm not let, I'm not preaching to anyone, but I've learned a few things. Hard work equals luck. And, and I did not put in some work before I went to that audition. I went to see every stage show Matthew called, but covertly every stage show he did. I went down to Blockbuster and hired every sooty videotape I could watch and watched every episode. I went to the toy shop and I bought all the puppets. I went to my friend, Brian Glover, who taught me the magic. I went to Lester and said, teach me, do a routine. What, what can I do with this? And I did that the week prior to this audition. So I went in with ev every feeling as hot, like I could have done no more. So of course, when they said to me, well, in the stage show, I said, well, I went to see them and, and, and I know it counted for, for a great deal. So there was a lot of you know, screen testing. There were other people they looked at as well. It wasn't just me. Um, and, uh, and, and after a lot of screen testing, uh, I remember Stanley phoning and saying, he, uh, he, he said, you've got it, it's you. And, and I cried. I just, I just cried and cried and cried. And, and, um, and, I, and I remember they said, uh, we're going to send you Sooty to practice with. And it, it's like something out of a dream. Um, I've told this story before, but it's true. So I was expecting some sort of flight case or 
you know, a special delivery or something. Anyway, I remember hearing this shoving sound and watching this jiffy bag being forced through the letterbox door and opening it up and with a compliment slip. There was, was Sooty in a jiffy bag. It was the most, un, you know, sort of undignified meeting. But I remember looking at it and thinking, this is, this is crazy. Um, and then the Sooty journey began, and that is a whole nother story. I mean, that, that's, that's a whole roller coaster, literally, in itself, because, it, again, that was, wasn't all easy. You'd think it would be, but it wasn't. Um, but you know, it was it was a life changing moment. I mean, completely for me. So, there you so go. when you so when you started with Sooty, it, were you? Because I know that you own Sooty. You know, you own the brand. You own everything, right? Yeah. Did you own the? You didn't own the brand when you first no. took it. So, no. would you mind sharing how that came to be and how all of that happened? Wow, um, I have to make this short. Uh, okay, <laughs> so I was their presenter. Um, I've been cast as their presenter and I did four series for ITV and the scripts, they started off okay and the, the scripts became terrible. They were rubbish. And because I, I loved it so much, I'd be fallen in love with Sooty so much and I'd, I'd got all the old Harry Corbett vintage stuff and I'd got all the, I'd done all my research and I loved it. I felt when they cast me, they gave me the impression they wanted me to have a great input into it in the way Matthew Corbett used to write everything. Well, they didn't want me to do anything. They just used to give me these scripts and it was awful. Um, some of the last stuff we did was terrible. It, it just, there was no, for no jokes, no slapstick. It was all moralistic and saying sorry to people. And it was just, but it wasn't the Sooty Show. And I remember the head of ITV Children's calling me up and said, look, I want to be the first to tell you uh, we're not renewing the Sooty TV series. She said, it's nothing to do with you. Um, but I just wanted you to know that we're not going to renew it. Now, when I took the job on, I just thought it would be a gig that lasted forever. So they didn't renew the series because the scripts were so bad. Matthew Corbett, who I was still a friend with, became friends with, I remember him saying to me, he said, if my father could have seen what they did with it, he'd turn in his grave. And I went, well, it was nothing to do with me. And on the internet, you know, it was horrible. There was all these fan sites, even in the early days of the internet. And they were saying, Richard Goodell ruined Sooty, it's rubbish. And, and it was so, again, I wanted to say, guys, I don't get, I had no control of this at all. You know, I just had to read the words and I was, you know, and, and it, was, it was that sort of thing. So what happened was because it came off the television, the whole brand became stagnant. And the, the owners of the brand, it changed hands a few times, never, nothing happened. The owners of the brand decided in 2008 they were going to sell it. Now, I hadn't, I mean, there is this, I would say, oh, I've done it for 23 years or whatever. Well, actually, that's, I say that publicly. I didn't because there was this pause, you know, in 2002, or whatever. It was press pause. Six years I didn't do it. I just, I worked, you know, I worked on the fairground, basically. I'll not be built, well, I say fairground, just, it was an amusement park. Um, and uh, I remember somebody calling me and said, have you seen the back page of The Guardian? It's to 2008 now. It said, uh, Sooty is for sale. It's, there's a story about it. It's for sale. They're selling the rights to it. So I remember going into the office with my brother. And by this point, our amusement park was, was quite big. We had some big rides and it was quite a big operation. And I said to my brother, I said, I don't care what this costs. We have to buy this. It's not about an ego. I said, we've got to put this right because I got, I took this so personally. I said, I know how to put this right. And all we have to do is just, just put it back. It's not gonna be hard to fix this. We have to buy it. And we went into sort of this closed bidding war. It was all a bit covert because um, they didn't, they, they sort of knew who I was, but I didn't want them to know it was me that was, was, was putting in bids, but several other people were bidding as well. And, and they'd given a guide price and I knew what Matthew Corbett had sold it for. And it was, it was, close to two million so um it was of course uh, when he sold it it was on television and it was this and it wasn't that now so we weren't at that level but we were certainly we were certainly you know we were certainly up there so uh, it was serious um sort of commitment from us financially but i just knew i said to my brother so look if we can't make this work again we'll put it to work on the amusement park and we'll build a little sooty feature and we'll do a little sooty show and we'll get some value out of it because it still means something to a lot of people. It's not on television now, but to a generation, it means some, we'll get, some, and he agreed with me, he supported me. And so we got the, 
we, we won the bid. They found out it was me and they were a bit like, oh God, it was him again, you know. Um, but we, we won it, we bought, we owned the brand. So now we're sat with this brand, which is not on television. It's not touring on stage. There's no toys, it's nothing. So I said to my brother, I said, look, we've got to get it back on the telly. I said, the first thing we've got to do. So I went back to ITV and the head of children's had changed, but she was lovely to me. And she said, well, uh, make a pilot, go and make a pilot. She said, she said, what are you going to do with it? I said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. So I'm going to put it back to exactly what it was, but when Matthew Corbett was doing it, Sweep and Sue, pies in the face. We're not going to educate everybody. It's the kids come home from school. They want to laugh. We're going to make it funny again. We're going to do, we're just going to, we're not going to change it. We're just going to put it back, but we're going to bring it, you know, it'll be modern, the modern world. And she said, oh, well, what did you know about TV shows? You never made one. Go, go and make a pilot. So um, I went and we shot this episode. Now it's on YouTube. It's called The Big Day Out. And it was the first thing that I ever wrote completely for Sooty with a friend of mine. And it's shot at our amusement park uh, by the sea. So we used our own location and the story is about us going for a day at the amusement park and whatever, going to the sea. So we shot everything on, on our own locations. And we took it back to the head of, of ITV. And Michael Vine was my agent then. Michael Vine is Darren Brown's agent and, 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 and was a formidable producer of television. And he had no intention of getting involved in producing a TV series because he's got enough to do. But he came with me and suddenly they gave, it gave me a lot of credibility. They went, oh, hang on a minute. Is Michael involved in making a TV show? Michael said, well, I'll watch over him and make sure he knows how to make a TV show. So that was a massive tick. And then they watched The Big Day Out. They didn't laugh at anything. It was like a silence for an hour. And I was just looking at Michael and thinking, oh, are they going to like this? Do they? What are they thinking? And she just turned at me, this lady at the end, and she just went, could you make 26 episodes? And I went, well, yeah, 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 I could. And she went, but I have to tell you, we don't have fortunes of money to give you to make it. And I want that location. And I realize it must have cost a fortune because the, and I, and I was just about to go, what well, does a matter of fact? And Michael kicked me under the table. He went, yes, it did. <laughs> so they never realized, and we shot. So if you watch the latest series, or, or it was always shot at a theme park. And I'm, I drew on my experience as a holiday camp entertainer to put the, the blue coat on. And I play, you know, this guy that's running this entertainment place, a theme park and a holiday camp. And that's why, so all that location, it was, um, it, it, was it was mine and my brother's amusement park. So um, it was it, it sort of all it all fell into place. And of course, once that came on the telly of people wanting to know, hang on, where's this park that, that's on the telly where Sooty lives? So then hang on, now all of a sudden the park's getting busier. So it was it, and then we started, of course, the theatre tours came off the back of that. And then the pantomime calls started happening. And um, yeah, so it, 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 it was just a big risk that we took. But I knew we could do it. I, it wasn't hard to fix. I mean, it was such it, it's, it's a massive risk. I mean, you paid whatever you paid for a brand that literally kind of had no value in many ways because it wasn't yeah. doing anything. I mean, that's... that's well, every year we would... every We were very, very lucky. Do you know what? It was a very lucky situation because I'm sure there were many people even probably with more talent and creativity than I that could have bought, that could have given something to that brand. I was in a very unique position um, because every year me and my brother would commit a, a chunk of money to buying a new ride. And it would be always be a significant thing, like a log flume or a, a, a huge something. So that year we didn't, we bought Sooty. So we had a little chunk of money sat there. And um, we were able also to, because obviously we use asset finance and things for these things, you know, we were able to secure some of the money for Sooty on all the assets we got. It was secured on the roller coaster, you know, <laughs> if we didn't pay for Sooty, they'd have took the coaster off us, you know, so, and we also, I was at that age where we were young, my brother, I didn't have any family, my brother didn't have any family, we were, you, you know, you take risks when you whatever, and, and we would, and I just said, what's the worst that could happen, you know, what, what's, what's the worst that could happen? Um, so, I, I mean, I look back sometimes and don't know quite how it happened, but thank God it did, because it changed my life and, 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 um, and I've been able to do so many wonderful, wonderful things with it and meet so many wonderful people. Um, it's been great, yeah. And it's gone strength from strength to strength, you know, yeah. and continued to go to strength to strength. And you've bought it back, like you said you were going to do. 
You took it back to its original idea. We spoke off camera beforehand. You've revitalized it. You've made it. You've still kept the core identity, but mm. at the same time, you've 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 kept it. You've made it bang up to date. It's brilliant. Yeah, we've got some. I mean, we got some belted new stuff coming out. There's something happening this Christmas, which is the most elaborate thing. I'm going into watch it being edited tomorrow. Most elaborate thing I've ever done with Sooty. I'll tell you. It, yeah, it's an exclusive. I'll probably get my knuckles wrapped for this, actually, because. <laughs> but I won't go into too much detail, other to say that there's there's going to be a Christmas video out with Sooty and sweeping it. Um, it's. I'll have to be cryptic. Oh, because there's some. I'm there. I'm not allowed to say because there's other people involved. But it's a Christmas video. It only lasts two minutes twenty seconds. This video, but it, it it's a very special, special, special thing for a great cause and and uh, it's the most elaborate thing I've ever shot with Sooty. I mean, movie, movie, movie style production, um, which we did a few weeks back and I'm gonna see it cut together tomorrow. And it's a Christmas themed thing. So we had snow and rain, real reindeers and Santa and a sleigh and 70 children and oh my goodness. So it was wonderful. Anyway, so that's a big clue. Watch, watch out for it. <laughs> I'll be watching that. That's amazing. And like I say, it does go from strength to strength. It, it continues to just be a hugely dominant force that's watched by, you know, so many kids and so many adults, if we're honest, as well. I mean, it's just, it's just brilliant. I'm going to ask you a question. Do you ever find sometimes, because you, you said to me, you know, you're a performer, you were born to do this, and you love performing on the, the illusions and before. And then you've kind of gone to spend the last 10, 15 years, 20 years associated with Sooty. Do you ever find that you've lost your own identity as a performer a little bit? And it's kind of, it's no longer, you know, like Richard Cadell, illusionist. It's now Richard Cadell and Sooty. And is that an issue or is that not an issue? Uh, well, it's... I love doing the sooty stuff. Um, I love it. But yes, I, I always feel I'm very res respectful of it's Harry Corbett's creation. Um, uh, Harry will always be Sooty's dad. Um, Matthew um, will always be, you know, a good friend of Sooty's. That's what in Harry's own words, he, he actually said Matthew was a good friend. I'm I'm his father. I mean Harry. So Harry, the Sooty will always be we Harry Corbett will always be Sooty's dad. So I do feel in a way I'm just the guardian of someone else's act, and hopefully somebody will carry it on when I do it. So um, which is why I've, I've, what happened was, what happened was, um, oh God, here we go. So I'm starting to do the big pantomimes as a result of Sooty. And me and my brother decided in 2014, we would sell our amusement park. He was going to emigrate and I was, we were 50-50, we were he was going to emigrate and I was going to just focus on doing the Sooty show and do more of that. And um, I, I said to myself, I said, right, when we sell that park, I'm going to treat myself. I'm going to buy a Mercedes SL500 AMG supercar. You know, I've always wanted one. And it was ridiculous. Anyway, I test drove, we sold the amusement park and I test drove this car. It was, it was a ridiculous amount of money. I mean, obscene and an embarrassing amount of money. And I got out of the car and I thought, what the hell was that all about? I'm not going to buy a car. It's just a car. What was I dreaming all these years? I thought, well, but I need to treat myself. I've done all, I built this business up and, and I thought, I know what I'll do. I'll, I'll buy an illusion. I'll buy an illusion. And when I when they phone me for the pantomime this year, I'm going to say, well, I'm going to do the sooty business, but I want to do a, an illusion where it's no sooty. I just want to be me. You know, mm. and I thought, this is my treat. This is my gift to myself for selling the business that we built up over 20, 30 years. And the one illusion I always wanted to do, which I could never afford, was Fran Sarari's slicer. Where, you know, we flip the girl mm -hmm. and stretch it out. Um, and I... No, no, nobody was building them over here. So I phoned Illusion Projects over in Las Vegas, which I didn't realise who that was. And I was on the phone to, and I'll tell you, here's a lovely story. So I'm on the phone to, I phoned Illusion Projects because somebody said, oh, they can build you on Illusion Projects. And, and a, a lady answered the phone and said, hi, can you build me a, a slice? You know, France or I slice. And she said, I'm sorry, we don't really have any time at the minute to build one of the Illusions for magicians. We've sort of stopped doing that. We tend to build... You know, the big shows, we do Copperfields, we do, you know, we tend to build shows in their entirety rather than one-offs. But if ever we get a gap in the production line, uh, we, we could fit it in. I said, well, here's my name. She went, uh, I said, call me if you get a name. It's Richard Cadell. And she went, hang on a minute. So we already make for you. 
I said, I've never bought anything off you. I could never afford to. So I haven't bought an illusion for 20 years. I said, I've not bought anything off you. She went, you have, you're on our system, Richard Cadell. And she went, hang on, I'll put you through. And it's Tim Clothier on the phone. And, and he went, Richard, I went, Tim, what are you doing out there? I taught Tim Clothier. I taught him every week his, his, his magic act that went, went on to win Young Magician of the Year. I taught him that. He had lessons with me for weeks and weeks and weeks because he lived in Taunton, which is about 30 minutes down the road from me. So he went, I hadn't spoken to him for 20 years. And it was his business. And he went, I said, what are you doing there? He said, well, this is my business. He said, of course, I'll build you a slicer. I said, what's all that Richard Goodell business? And this, I say this with great humility. He said, well, when we build stuff for Copperfield, he said, it's under strict confidentiality. And even the people that work for us are not allowed to know what they're building and more importantly, who it's for. So he said, the code name for a Copperfield order is Richard Goodell. He said, and that's because you taught me. Uh, and and, and I, I had a little moment at that. I, I, I you know, I, I, I had a moment about that. And, and that's probably the biggest compliment anyone's ever paid me. And he said, so you're really going to mess the order system up now. We're going to have Richard Goodell too now. So anyway, so he built me this slicer. So I announced to the pantomime company I was going to do the slicer. And as soon as it arrived, it was so beautiful. And it was, oh, it's such a beautiful, beautiful thing. And then I was, uh, that was it then. I went mad. I said, right, okay, I want a bump in the night. I want this and I want that. And then suddenly I've got this big illusion act and I'm doing these, these in the pantomimes now, I, I have my own illusion spot. And then as a result of that, a guy came to see me in the pantomime and, and said, I'd love to do a magic show with, with, you know, I've seen the illusionists and I've seen this, I'd love to do it. And would you do the illusions? And, and I just thought, well, yeah, you know, I'm getting on a bit, what an opportunity. And I said, well, as long as the get-ins and get-outs are easy and you, you know, as long as it's, let's make, make it easy because these are big things to move, get that bit right and I'm on board. And, um, and hence this is this ridiculous extreme magic thing where I get to, bring to play at being the illusionist I always dreamed that I would be with the equipment that I always dreamed I'd have and could never remotely come close to when I was trying to really make it I couldn't have the wonderful toys that I've got now I mean and it's just it's pure passion it's pure indulgence now I just I just adore doing it I mean I don't it crazy that you told a story that like many many years ago you thought you know when you were when the theatres ended you know what I'm done I'm gonna go and and, and do this I, I you sold all your illusions yeah. you know now all these years later wow if you could go back and and speak to young Richard back then and say this is what I'm going to be doing in 20 odd years time well if I'd have seen all those props that I've got now I wouldn't have dreamed I've ever got them nice little try and being indulgent doing all the talking um but but just to, again another lovely circle that came round um when i was putting this together this for extreme magic i mean i had enough good props that i could do a pant spot in pantomime but i know i needed more things um so i went to see danny hunt and i went have you still got the bike vanish this is 20 years on and he went yeah i said could i borrow it and he went well why don't you buy it i went yeah, I'd love to. So he sold it to me for exactly the same price I sold it to him to 20 years before. And the bike vanish is, um, and it, it is closing the show. My prop, the, the same prop that Dave Shaw built for me all those years ago on credits, exactly the same prop. And I'll tell you, I get probably get a bit emotional now, but we've, we did Extreme Magic once so far. We, we did a trial show in Liverpool just after COVID to see if it would work and for James, the producer, to take some video of the thing, to put a trailer together to see if he could sell a tour. And I did the motorcycle vanish again. I'd refined it, I'd changed some, it was the prop, I'd changed some subtleties to it. And I think when magicians see it, they'll love one little element of it because I've spent 20 years thinking about it, thinking if ever I did it again, I'd do that because I never thought I would. So um, they'll love one little bit. I'd love to tell you, but I won't spoil it. But. Um, but the nice thing was, uh, is that Dave Shaw died um, last year, um, uh, probably more than a year ago now, actually. And uh, he always viewed that as his finest hour, that trick, and that his, as an illusion builder. And I went to see him in his bed. And um, he died several days after I went to see him. 
and he, he, he was very upbeat when I came and I said, look, Dave, I showed him the video. I said, look, I'm doing it again. Here it is. He was so proud. He was so pleased. And, and um, whenever I do it now, I just think of him and the journey that we had together building it. And, and you know, that man, he, 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 he let me owe him money f on that thing for years because I hadn't got the money to pay him and, and stuff back then. But um, yeah, it's lovely to think that I'm doing it again. And, and do you know what? It closes the show. And after all these years and all that expensive stuff from Tim and all those wonderful props I have, nothing beats the, the motorcycle vanish nothing not for a lay audience nothing so there you go that's a little awesome. yeah that's amazing and mm. i want to talk about the show and then I, I i've got one other question but let's talk about the show because you're touring in october um and and i'm going to put a link down below where people can look at the different tour dates and they can look at uh uh where where to get tickets but it's an incredible lineup like it's a really, yeah. really incredible show. It is, and I've got to. I, I'm, I'm not begging people to come and see it, um, but I'm telling you now, it will never happen again at this level. I mean, there's been some great sh magic shows touring. I'm not knocking them, and a lot of my pals are in them. But James Shown, the producer, is a magic nut. He soaks it up. He goes to Vegas and watches everyone and loves it. And I'll tell you now, this makes no financial sense. That lineup that he's got is brilliant, but the, he's touring lighting and plasma screens and, and, and six flamethrowers and pyrotechnics of the scale. He's, I mean, there are six dancers, there are fire eaters, there are, there's all that stuff that isn't on the poster. Um, and he's doing this. We know we're gonna, it's, it makes no financial sense at all for him. Um, and and, and it, it's one of those shows that will never happen again. It, it won't happen again because it just, he's doing this purely to, to, to do a really great magic show. This is not about numbers, but at the same time, I really want to see people come and support it because I, I, he, he deserves to at least not lose quite as much as he's probably going to lose. He doesn't mind. He, he just wanted to be brilliant. Uh, he'll phone me up. Oh, I've gone and bought this. Oh, James, you know, how many more flames do we need? You know, I mean, uh, you know, what about if we do this? Well, how much is that going to cost you? So, um, but it, so, so I'm very honoured to be, I mean, I'm just one of the acts in it. I'm not, I'm not producing it or anything. It's his show. But when I hear, when I, I, I just know what he's wrapping around it in terms of production value and, and, it just, I hope people see it because it's going to be one of those things that people talk about and, and we're not going to tour it again. It won't, it just won't, it, just, it won't happen again. This is it. We'll do it for October. Um, yeah. And I might not probably ever have my chance to showcase all these big props again, because I'm doing stuff like the Jaws of Death and, you know, and, and, and I've got a beautiful impaled, a slightly different a little thing I'm doing slightly different with that which is which is nice but I'll, I'll never do that in a panto they're not going to put buttons on a sword and impale me or, you know that's not going to happen so I don't know when I'll get, ever do this stuff ever again so for me I sort of you know uh it's a bit of a you know it's, it's a very special tour for me but yeah you're right it's a belt in lineup belt in lineup wow that's incredible that's incredible uh mm. and I'm, I've got my tickets I'm going to be I'm going to be coming and seeing it I'm so excited I really good am. I'm really, please, really excited. Please, do. there's some, there's some lovely stuff in there. Some nice stuff. And then, and obviously, you know, for the people that don't know who's in the show, you've got uh, John Archer, who, yeah. for my money, is one of the funniest men in 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 magic. You know, yeah. brilliant. You've got uh, Richard Jones, the only person to win Britain's Britain's Got Talent. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It's just wow. Yeah, and some Continental acts. James has found um, two two guys that haven't been seen um, really in the UK before. Arcadio and uh, I can't pronounce her name. She does a quick change and some other stuff. So they're they're flying in for that. Um, and then when we do Wimbledon, um, Pete Furman swaps out with John for that. So um, Pete's brilliant. So um, anyone coming to Wimbledon will, will get the chance to see Pete. So, but it's all kind of very fast, very edgy. Everything's bang, bang, bang. No one's on for very long. It's three minutes, five minutes, three minutes, five minutes. It moves like light, you know, that's what he wants. It does no, no indulgence. It's, it's, it's everything moves like, you know, like a rocket, you know, that's how he wants it. It's yeah. great. No, no sort of comparing and welcome. It's just bang, 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 you know, which is lovely. It's, it's lovely. We we're talking, I remember, um, sorry, I'm bloody, I'm terrible for gassing. I've got a gas bag. Oh, we were talking just, be just before 
I'll let you into a little secret. Just before we started talking, we were just about to go live and, and Russ Stevens phones you. Yeah. yeah. Who I happened to have a uh, lunch with yesterday in Blackpool. Now, back in the day, Russ's show, Mystique, if anyone saw that show, when Mystique was at its prime and nothing Russ else that, like it. Nothing else like it. There, it was everybody wanted to be Russ. I mean, and, and to be in that show. I mean, it was at that time, it, it was because it moved. There was there was no gaps, there was no airtime, it just moved. So all I can say with extreme is that it it has that kind of bang to it. You know, I mean, but yeah, but, but we were reminiscing and I was I was talking about Mystique yesterday and it all came back. What a great, great magic and illusion show that was. And um, so, yeah, so hopefully we'll channel a bit of that <laughs> into extreme. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. So here's one more question for you. What, one more question. I mean, let's be honest, you have achieved so much in your career both in and outside of magic you know you built a huge business that you then sold and 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 did remarkably well from i mean that's just outside of magic but you've performed at an incredibly high level from a very young age you've achieved success after success after success is there anything left i mean you've even and i'm genuinely serious about this if you took one small subsection of your career and said to the majority of magicians if you could achieve that at the end of your career, would you be happy to go, yeah? And you're not at the end of the year, your career, to be clear. And yet you've achieved that and so much more. And, and now you're back doing the illusions, which you've always wanted to do and doing a touring show. Like, what's left? I mean, you're done, right? There can't be anything left on your magical bucket list. <laughs> uh, uh, do you know what? I, I'm at this wonderful point now where probably the it's not by design, there probably isn't. I'm just, Phil Hitchcock's a pal. I mean, you know, I think Phil's a brilliant, brilliant performer, really good and great, great mind. And we, we were talking, because again, we've all grown up together, more the same age. And he said, he coined it, he said, do you know what? He said, we just enjoy it now, don't we? So we've got nothing to prove anymore. Just enjoy it. And you know what? I go out now and I think, well, yeah, I don't have anything else. I've, I've been so lucky, oh, I have done everything I'd, I'd love to do so now I just just I just enjoy it I just enjoy it. I, I, I don't get nervous and I, I get excited now about it I don't get nervous I just I just soak it up so I don't think there's I don't know I don't I, 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 I'm not sure there is anything I mean on my I mean I'll share this with you I mean this is this is a personal thing but um you know it might come as a surprise to people that know me but the biggest thing that's happening to me in my life right now, and it's the perfect time because you, you rightly said, I've, I've, I've had a, a wonderful, happy, happy life exploiting all the things I love. And, and, and even the funfair business, you know, you say you built a business, well, I built it on, I love that business. I, I absolutely adored it. You know, I've got a buzz at it and I'm still dabbling in it now, I have to tell you, you know, I mean, can't keep away from it. Um, so, so I've only ever done things that I love, but I'm, I've had, there is a point in my life now where there is, there is a big change happening and, and I'll share this with you and it's probably the most magical thing ever. I'm having children. Um, yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah it's, 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 it's a long, tricky journey, but uh, we're well on the way. So um, I'll have a baby, uh, definitely within, yeah. So there'll be a time when I can't quite do so much, but the thought of doing that now uh that that for me now is, is 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 my to be able to 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 do that and i think you know that that's the biggest yeah thing for me right now is focusing on on starting a family at my age so uh that's a bit of news isn't it eh? Never bit of news. you know the best thing i ever did was was become a dad genuinely you know well and look what you've done you've created a, another magician <laughs> you know genuinely right, yeah. brilliant mm. too you must be very proud, you know. Really I know Matt, Matthew Corbett told me he couldn't stand Sooty. He got sick of it. He said his earliest memory was his dad shoving the thing over his cock, you know. And he was like, oh, dad, not, no, no, we don't want him at the party again. I hope my kids don't, you know, sort of, oh, not again, dad. No, don't, not again. <laughs> Please, not that. 
<laughs> but that, that's the dream at the minute anyway. So we, we, that's, that's, that's Well, I mean, obviously it's not here yet. So, we, you know, there's all the, you know, there's all of that to go through. So you know, there's a bit of luck we need as well, but it looks very, well, that's it. It's happening. So. That's congratulations. congratulations. Thank you very much. That's Thank amazing. You. That's wonderful news. And I want to, yeah. I want to, before we wrap it up, let me ask you one more question. One thing that's come across in this interview is your love of sooty and your love of the history and you know your desire to bring it back to where it is now and you mentioned earlier on in the interview hey hopefully somebody else will take over at some point down the road as somebody who is obviously so passionate about this brand and has put so much time and effort into it is there i don't want to call it an exit strategy but is there a plan to continue sooty um at some point down the down the line or is it just a case of you'll cross that bridge when you come to it well i, th I think if i'm really honest you know sooty I, I won't be able to to you know do my illusions forever even if i had a vehicle to do them because there comes a point when you might look a bit not you know a bit old or a bit whatever um to do that stuff whereas sooty i you know the, the precedent's been set with harry and matthew so I know I can carry on performing. I love performing. I love pantomime. So I think I'd carry on. I'd, I, I'd hate to retire. I don't want to, you know, I, it's a vehicle for me to, to be able to, to play all those silly parts and do that stuff. Um, but there is a bit of a, a thought process happening. We've just finished. We made this year, we made another series for, for ITV that will kick out next year, which is a different format. And it's, it's we're trying something a bit different. I, I'm pleased with it. I'm pleased with it. And hopefully that might pave the way for, for, for a time when maybe I don't always do it. Because my, my mission is to make sure this little bear lives on. And I think whoever, I, I don't think, I mean, I, I'm sort of almost proof that you can't, if I, if I was to find somebody to present it and hire them, you've got to own it. You, you've got to be the guy that owns it to present it. I don't think it would work for me to hire someone because then they might, I don't know, you, you're risking your whole brand on someone you don't know and there's an agent negotiating and suddenly they don't want to do it and all of that stuff. Um, so really, I think either someone's got to buy the whole thing and, and, and love it and, and, and do it, or there's got to be a way it can operate without me or not particularly with any one person. But we're a long way off that um, because I have no intentions of stopping <laughs> it. I'm going to grow old. As, they'll, well, I have a deal with my partner and they're going to tell me when they're going to say, Rich, now's the time. You know, this is this is this is when you, this is when you, you, you passed it. Um, but I have no intentions of that being any time soon. So uh, I'll carry on with the little fella. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. That's amazing. Richard, this has been an incredible interview. It really has. You've you've had such a, uh, such an interesting eclectic life, and you've done so much and gone in so many different directions. If you could give one, let's wrap this interview up. If you could give one piece of advice, because this is watched by magicians all over the UK, as somebody who has achieved so much success, to uh, can, if you could give one piece of advice to people out there that are starting to carve a career for themselves now and would like to achieve success in this industry? And on, a, on a professional level? Yeah. yeah. Also, I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll tell you. I, I, I can give you, I mean, it, it, I'll try and make it as short as possible. Um, well, the, the, all I can say is that just be nice. Be nice. Just respect the fact you're in a business that everybody is in the business. Everyone in this business is in there basically because they love it. You should, you should, they love it. So respect that I was never jealous of other magicians because they love magic like I did. I could never understand why people got, you know, be nice because when people employ people, be a team player, you know, because it, it, I know in the pantomime company I work for, there's some very talented people, far better than, than I am, comedian-wise and all that stuff, that they don't employ because they're not team players. They might be brilliant, but they're not team players. And it, it's just important to just just remember to, that it just to, to sometimes don't be the diva. Don't just remember it's important to enjoy what you do and 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 just listen and to people and or try and see things from both sides but if you've you know i've seen confrontational people um 
you know, there's a difference between fight, you know, you, you've got to stand your ground if you want something to be perfect, when people want something to be just right and they know what they're talking about. There's that. That's one thing. But just, I would say just, if you want to be successful, you've got to be liked. I'm not saying you've got to act, but you've got to remember that people have got to want to be around you to employ you and give you those opportunities. So, um, and if you love what you do, that comes naturally anyway. But so just, yeah. That sounds a bit preachy, doesn't it? Oh, it but, doesn't. It reminds me of that Wayne Dobson line. It's nice to be important, but it's more important to be nice. Yeah, I mean, it's a bit lame, I suppose, in some ways. But, I, you know, I, I know I've got gigs sometimes, not because I've been the best, but because I've been prepared to just, you know, muck in and, and, and do as directed and, and whatever, you know. So That's amazing amazing advice and i want everyone watching this to go and uh support you so the i'm going to put the tour dates down below like like you said this might not never happen again so it's it's now is the time right yeah now is the time to go and check that, that you're you're literally touring all over the uk so there's yeah. places that people yeah can... yeah but there's there's plenty of opportunity yeah uh, to go please yeah i'd love people to come and support it just because yeah it would be just be lovely, be lovely. And we're going to do a little meet and greet thing afterwards and, and all that stuff. Be lovely, just be nice. And, and if, if you don't get a chance to say hello, I'm always at Blackpool Convention. Never miss it, ever. Cancel everything about that. So, you know, always, you know, if you ever, you know, anyone ever wants to talk to me or ask me anything, if they think I can, you know, just come up to me. And if you don't get a chance to, you know, if you want to see the show and don't get a chance to say hello, come and just come and, you know, talk to me. <laughs> be nice i like that. that's what it's all about i don't so I, when i go to blackpool i've seen very little, few of the lectures and things i just like that's what it's all about isn't it just talking Hanging about out. what we love yeah what we love yeah and where can people see you at panto this year you've mentioned panto a few times where are you going to be um i'm back i'm going back to southampton i did it last year um and i'm going back to the mayflower in southampton jason donovan is the the star um and I'm doing, because I've got, I did a, a my illusions last year, I'm doing more illusions this year. So I get to do, I'm doing the, the motorcycle vanish uh, in the pantomime this year, among other things. Um, so yes, yeah, so I'm uh, super looking forward to doing that in the panto. So yeah, Mayflower Theatre, Southampton, uh, it's Goldilocks and the circus acts in it as well. So, and I'm Joey the Clown. So. Nice. <laughs> That's awesome. That's yeah. Brilliant. Well, you know what? Congratulations on all of your success. Congratulations on everything you're achieving. And more importantly, congratulations on being a dad. That is brilliant. Well, so, not yet, but it's like, well, yeah. Getting there. Yeah. Count, yeah. Counting, counting down. Counting, counting down. down. That's yeah, amazing. well, yeah, you'll see me pushing the chair around the convention. Yeah, <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> That's brilliant. All right. Richard, thank you so much for the interview. I really appreciate it. I want everyone to leave a comment down below. So uh, let Richard know what you thought. Leave a comment down below and uh, go check out the description link. There's going to be a link uh, to where you can go get tickets. It's going to have all of the tour dates. I'm also going to put a link down there uh, for the Mayflower so you can check out the pantomime. Go have a look at all of that information and, uh, and, and let's support the show because I know I'm going and it's going to be brilliant. Thank you so much. Richard, thank you so much, my friend. I'll see you again soon. Take care. Bye now. Mm.